This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. Kaliapea envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other organizations they support include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit kaliapea.org. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. In my opinion, everyone is just putting a lot of money into fighting back with weapons, while in reality, what you really need is to fight back with information. Intelligence decreased the militarization of information. Andrea Crosta has over 30 years of experience in conservation projects around the world, and in a parallel professional career, he has been working for over 18 years as an international consultant to companies and governmental agencies on high-end security technologies and services, homeland security, anti-piracy, and risk management. He now applies this unique knowledge to conservation and wildlife protection. Andrea is the executive director and co-founder of Elephant Action League, an intelligence-led nonprofit organization dedicated to wildlife crime. He is also among the founding members of the Wildlife Justice Commission, a member of the board of the Africa Conservancy Foundation, and the creator and project manager of Wild Lakes, the first whistleblower initiative dedicated to wildlife crime. Andrea is among the main protagonists of the documentaries The Ivory Game and Sea of Shadows, which recently won the Audience Award at Sundance Film Festival 2019. So, Andrea, it's so wonderful to have you on the show today. It was lovely to meet you and the crew at Sundance, and I'm really happy that we get to continue our conversation and go a bit more in depth. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. So when we broach the subject of endangered kin, many of us just jump to habitat loss and climate change as driving factors, failing to remember that wildlife crime is one of the most immediate threats to many species. And I think this is a symptom of this larger occurrence in which climate change subsumes conversations around environmental crime in terms of pollution and poaching at a smaller scale. But we have to bring awareness to the fact that in half a century, lion numbers in Africa have decreased from over 200,000 to less than 20,000. That over a century ago, the world's tiger population exceeded 100,000 and now there are less than just 4,000. We have lost 97% of the world's tiger population in just one century. So aside from these glaring statistics, how significant of a threat is wildlife crime, not only to iconic endangered species like the elephant, but to all different species and ecosystems across the planet? Yeah, it's, I, I, I could not agree more. I mean, I there are many species, like like you mentioned, tiger, lion, but elephants, rhinos, pangolins, I have a long list. There are many species that there are a good chance that they will never see the effects of climate change because they will not be alive by the time. Crime is the number one threat to many, many species, not like the iconic species that you have uh, in mind, like elephants and rhinos and tigers. But it's also it's also about illegal logging and illegal fishing. So it's combined environmental crime is, uh, I think, uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, threats that we are facing right now. Um, and the problem is that, and it's something, it's a problem that is connected to uh, why we have been failing to face this problem for for decades, is that we we still see this as an environmental problem because animals are involved, because forests and fishes are involved. But in reality, it's a crime problem with capital C. And until we don't have that switch, we'll never be able to fight back as we should. Mm -hmm. Right. It's because people see it as an environmental problem. They they, they think it's somehow less than, which is really insane because the environment literally sustains life itself and keeps us surviving. So I I really appreciate you pointing that out. It, it, wildlife crime combined with illegal fishing and illegal logging is the fourth largest criminal enterprise 
on the planet, you know, after drug smuggling, counterfeiting, and, and human trafficking, the fourth largest criminal enterprise. We're talking about between 100 and $250 billion per year. So it's a, it's a serious thing, and pretty serious people are involved. So it's not about, uh, you know, the poor people in the bush killing an elephant. Yet yeah, this is a part of the, of, the, of the issue. It's actually a very small part because actually the crime is, is actually the enablers and the, and the drivers of these crimes are actually very wealthy people, criminal organization, uh, criminal syndicates and kingpins and, and, you know, very dangerous people doing all sort of crimes at the same time. We, with our work, we work in now in three continents, Africa, Asia and Latin America. And most of our targets, you know, we investigate wildlife crime. We collect intelligence on, on wildlife crime. This is what we do. And many of our targets are involved in other crimes, including drug uh, trafficking, including human trafficking and and money laundering and fake documents. And the reason is because it's very, very profitable uh, environmental crime with very low risk because most countries are still unprepared to face it. Hence the, you know, the presence of uh, even militias, even terrorist group like Al-Shabaab in Somalia is actually involved in, was involved a lot in ivory trafficking because you make a lot of money and we, you risk very little. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making that differentiation between you know, impoverished people, say, in the bush versus these very organized uh, cartels and mafias and things like that. I, I appreciate that. And I want to talk about that a bit more later on in the interview. Um, so my next thought is, you know, ironically, but perhaps unsurprisingly, we see a spike in the illegal export of certain species around the same time that they achieve recognition as endangered species. For example, in 2010, the European Union banned all exports of European eel, declaring it critically endangered. But following this announcement, there was an immediate spike in eel export from the eastern United States coast. Similarly, the near extinction of the Chinese Bahaba was led to the poaching of the Totoaba in the Gulf of California. So I'm wondering, how is trafficking actually exacerbated? by the banning of critical endangered species and what does this require in terms of foresight around what species are perhaps not currently endangered because of their location but may soon become so it's a good question the short answer is that uh, you know many of these species simply become endangered because of poaching and trafficking because of wildlife crime and it seems like that unless they are, you know, the numbers are, you know, are getting really low, nobody really care. And uh, including, you know, including the media, it's, uh, for example, in the mind of the people, lions in Africa are not really endangered while they, they're, they are facing an incredible pressure, you know, from hunting and, and trophy hunting and trafficking of bones and fangs and, and, and meat for, you know, for the Asian market. So, it's my feeling is that if it's, if if an animal is is not really in danger, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't. Uh, you know, there's not enough attention around it. So criminals can continue for years destroying the population until until sometimes it's too late. The example of the of the totoaba in the Gulf of California, and you know, I don't know how many of you knows about you know the the the, the vaquita crisis. So the vaquita is the smallest and rarest porpoise. It's, it's a sort of whale. They live only in the Gulf of California, in the Sea of Cortez, and they and they were uh, you know there are maybe between twenty and thirty individuals left in the whole Gulf of California. There used to be hundreds, and uh, the reason is that the, the vaquita is a bycatch of, uh, of of the fish the fish that's called totoaba. It's uh, the swim bladder of the of this fish is uh, is very very expensive and on the black market in China, and the bycatch is this dolphin, and only now everyone is actually waking up and say, hey, wow, we just have there are only twenty left, and uh, and only now they're finally started to see this problem as a criminal problem because until believe me, until not long ago, it just it was just a a sort of illegal fishing, but with, with you know, with poor fishermen and and uh, lack of law enforcement, and and you know, it's at the end of the day, it was about animals, and so not that serious. 
and our investigation actually showed that uh, there are real cartels uh, operating in the area now. One single fish is five thousand dollars. We're talking about millions of dollars. So it's a, a former narco traffickers are now working together with Chinese traffickers. And as you can imagine, it's a whole different film. It's a completely different situation. It's very dangerous. People are actually involved. People getting killed just because it's, it's a lot of money. And in uh, and Vaquita is in the middle of all this. And uh, every year, the numbers are going down and down. But this is a typical example of, of a species that almost below the radar progressively disappear in front of our eyes. It's extinction in real time. I don't know, maybe we are sometimes bombarded with all those, you know, emer- not only, you know, human emergency, but, you know, we know about the elephant, we know about the rhino, we know about the tiger, so many other, many other species or many other crime-related, uh, wildlife crime-related problems. Uh, it's certainly a challenge for us. You know, they are pretty much all fixated with the same two, three species. Uh, perhaps we can shift to the importance of an intelligence-led approach to wildlife crime. Now, the Elephant Action League, which you co-founded, clarifies that an intelligence-led approach is necessary to foster a proactive, impactful, and really disruptive approach to conservation models. So I'd love if you could begin by sharing how the work of EAL differs from previous conservation models and how can intelligence-led efforts serve as an opportunity to be more inclusive and less exploitative to communities that have been otherwise targeted under historical conservation models. Yeah. If you you allow me, I will, uh, you know, link my, my answer to something we touched briefly touched before. So about, you know, poachers and poor people getting exploited by traffickers. In my opinion, and this is one of the most important reason we have been failing collectively in the past decades to, you know, to face this problem, in a different way, is that uh, everyone, media, NGOs, donors, the public, they have been obsessed and and focused on the very two ends of of those supply chains. We work in terms of illegal supply chain. doesn't really matter if it's a rhino horn, if it's ivory, if it's pangolin, if it's totoaba fish, doesn't really matter. There is always a supply chain, an illegal supply chain with origin, transit, and destination countries. And everyone is obsessed with the two ends of the supply chain. On the one hand, you you find the, the poacher, uh, and and it's easy to you know to consider poachers the villain, you know the, the people that you have to hate and that you possibly want you want to kill them or jail them, uh, because they are physically those who kill the animal. Or everyone is fixated with uh, on on the other end of uh, the supply chain, which is destination countries, let's try to change the mentality of the buyers with with billboards and awareness campaigns, let's use celebs and and things like that. Nobody's actually looking right in the middle of the supply chain where the real enablers and drivers profit from everything. And here where intelligence comes. If you look at other global threats like terrorism, like narco trafficking, like uh, weapons of mass destruction, like even organized crime, intelligence is always at the very heart of your strategy to fight back. You cannot even dream to fight back terrorism or or narco-trafficking without intelligence. When you look at environmental crime, despite being the fourth largest criminal uh, enterprise in the the world, there's no intelligence. Nobody is doing intelligence. Why? Because, you know, for governments, governments usually don't like other kinds of intelligence uh, because, you know, they feel uncomfortable. They you know, they want to control information. And for the regular NGO, it's, it's too difficult. You know, if you look at other global threats like terrorism, like uh, narco trafficking, like weapons of mass destruction, organized crime, intelligence, you need intelligence to fight back. Intelligence is at the very heart of your strategy to fight back. You cannot dream to fight international narco trafficking or terrorism without intelligence. Uh, Because through intelligence, you know who does what and when. You know things, which is at the the base to understand what is the best strategy to to fight. In environmental crime, you don't find any sort of intelligence work by anyone. Uh, We think we are the only ones, basically. And uh, governments, it's not a priority. It's not a big priority, environmental crime. So they don't set up intelligence services dedicated to environmental crime. And also they don't... They usually feel uncomfortable with other, you know, intelligence work that they cannot control. 
for an NGO is too difficult, beginning from their mindset, you even to understand what intelligence means. So most NGOs are, you know, they they do uh, other kind of conservation work in the field. And if they deal with wildlife crime, environmental crime, they, they do awareness, they do maybe capacity building, training, but nobody does real professional intelligence work. I mean, long-term undercover operations aim at collecting all kind of intelligence, all kind of information, producing intelligence, they work with crime analysts. So intelligence is, is basically collecting information 24-7, 360 degrees forever on anything and anyone then if you do a good work, uh, you produce actionable intelligence, and this actionable intelligence can be shared with law enforcement, can be used for an investigation, but you know, intelligence and investigation is two different things. And that's the main problem, in my opinion. Actually, actually, this is the problem. Uh, so right now we are fighting environmental crime globally as Boy Scouts, uh, just you know, by trying to kill and jail the poachers who are, you know, as you can imagine, easily replaceable and, and very often as exploited as the animals by the traffickers or billboards and using celebs, you know, to tell people, please don't buy ivory, please respect elephants. And, and I believe me, I've been to China many, many times. I met traffickers. I met buyers. They uh, they don't care so much about any message that we, we, we send from here. So this is why our organization is focused entirely on intelligence collection, the investigation as well. We talk just in terms of crime and we talk to governments actually just in terms of crimes. We share a lot of confidential information about high level targets or people, individuals, organization trafficking wildlife globally. And we share this information with Chinese authorities, with US authorities, Mexican authorities, Thai authorities. Uh, Kenyan authorities, uh, because our job is to do their job, basically, is to do what they are not doing. So um, we, Elephant Action League is unique in, in, in only, not only in, in what we do, but also who we are. We are, you know, our core team is made up of, you know, former CIA, former FBI, former law enforcement, former crime analyst. We are not the, the classic NGO. You know, we are an NGO, but uh, the DNA is very, very different is actually more similar to an intelligence agency because we consider vital to know as much as possible on those crimes and and sometimes you know the, the current approach is just uh, you know very very superficial they just uh, connecting a few dots on the surface without knowing that below those dots there are gigantic icebergs that you have to know mhm mm mhm mm yeah that makes so much sense because the intelligence that you and the EAL crew are able to collect, like what you said was actionable intelligence. It's it's not just a few dots, but it's taking it to the to the extreme. It's taking it to the edge of the knowledge so that there can be strategies and implementation solutions or, or solutions implemented. So I really I really am excited by this and it's very um yeah, it's riveting to to hear about the work that you all are doing. And, you know, and I, as I was preparing for this interview, I was reminded of just how absolutely absurd and depraved this venture is. That when we trace it to demand, we find that cheetah cubs are shipped to the United Arab Emirates to be sold as pets through Instagram, or that marine life is literally lifted from Hawaiian reefs, flown to LA, then to Miami, and then to Russia, where they're sold as pets. Yet as absurd as it is, wildlife crime is, like you were saying earlier, it's the world's fourth largest criminal enterprise. And in 2016, the value was estimated somewhere between $91 and $258 billion. So I would really love to hear more about what sort of revenue is generated not only in wildlife crime, but also through the bribes that are necessary to facilitate this work. You know, where is the money coming from to continue to finance such lavish and truly absurd imports and exports? Yeah, so it's it's a chain, isn't it? That's why it's very. We always suggest to look at these uh, problems in terms of uh, supply chains. Okay, there is the supply chain of ivory, there is supply chain of rhino, of coral, or tutuaba, and like in any 
other supply chain, not just illegal supply chain. There are always players, you know, actors that are more important than others who actually drive the whole thing. So they, the demand for these kind of products doesn't come only from the very, very end consumers, maybe a guy in China buying, I don't know, ivory chopsticks. It's not that simple because a lot of demand is actually fueled by the traffickers. Now, for example, the most important wildlife traffickers in the world are based in Southeast Asia. So Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. So the most important wildlife traffickers are there and they have been operating from there for, for ages. So they are very, they know exactly what they are doing. They, they can pretty much smuggle out of Africa, Asia, and even Latin America, whatever you want. They have, you know, they have the right channels. They know exactly who to bribe and when to bribe. And they, pro and they combine it with other kind of trafficking. Very interesting thing that you see in Southeast Asia with this trafficker because it's our work actually to get very close to them. We actually engage them. Our undercover teams get very close to them, become friends. They, of course, we film them undercover because for us, evidence is everything. We want, when you want to help law enforcement, they need evidence. So we film you know, meetings, we negotiate with them, uh, different kind of products. And you see the convergence of all these wildlife. It's incredible. The same person in Bangkok or in Hanoi, the same person, the same trafficker or trader during the same meeting can offer you rhino, ivory, pangolin, fish, live orangutans and illegal timber during the same meeting and that's why it's so important to go after these people because they're it's as you can imagine they're they are difficult to replace they have a lot of knowledge when you capture them you can actually get more information from them and you know when you take down one of these guys like taking down a million poachers you know it's it's the the ripple effect back to the field africa or asia or whatever is huge I give you an example. A little bit more than a year ago in Bangkok, the Thai authorities arrested two of the most important wildlife traffickers in the world. One was in Thailand, the other one was in Laos. And we did most of the work leading to the arrest, meaning that we did our, we conducted intelligence operations and investigation for almost a an year in Thailand and neighboring country. And then when we got enough information, both were wanted, by the way, then we join up with the Thai law enforcement and they made their arrest. And it's a classic, beautiful example of uh, how an NGO like us can work with, uh, in a good way, in a perfect way, actually, with law enforcement, just helping each other. These guys that got arrested, they are behind the smuggling of tons of ivory during the past year, tons of rhino horns live uh, orangutan from uh, from southeast asia from borneo so you can imagine the importance to take down this kind of people of course you need time because intelligence requires time you have to work uh, uh, you know you have to the way we work you know we have assets on the ground we build the network of informants and sources and we collect information it's a you know sometimes it's a it look uh, it sounds glamorous but but sometimes it's very boring because it's a lot of data that you know we have to collect our crime analysts are you know incredible young people you know working with different kind of softwares that they help the people in the field the teams in the field to understand what we're getting and then finally you know piece by piece you see the puzzle in front of your eyes and you see what you you know what you're getting from the field in that case we got very close to these people and and then they got arrested so this is a classic example of intelligence work and investigative work in the field in collaboration with law enforcement aimed at disrupting the supply chain by hitting the right spots, you know, the right people. Of course, I, I understand is uh, the regular person or the media understands better when a poacher gets killed in South Africa, for example, because you even... You can even visualize it better, right? You know, there is a there is a rhino was alive in the, in the national park, and then the poachers got into the park and killed the rhino, and then the rangers killed the poacher. And it's easy to understand. The problem is that then everyone is fixated with that situation. And you think that you can reverse, can, you can fight back simply by doing anti-poaching. This is a gigantic mistake 
to think that when you do anti-poaching, you actually addressing the problem. You are not addressing anything. You're just buying time for those animals. And it's, that's why it's important to do anti-poaching. But, you know, nobody should uh, have the illusion that with anti-poaching, you're actually doing something to make, to, you know, to, to solve the situation. I'd like to talk about anti-poaching and the militarization of conservation. But first, I I just want to finish up this thought around um, the supply chains. And I'm thinking about the geography of trafficking and the function of transit countries. You know, their choke points and exit points and how they're just absolutely vital to maintaining the mass scale at which wildlife crime operates at. So how do you how do different geopolitical realities affect your operations in transit countries? Are certain government bodies, say, more hesitant in stopping criminals or less likely to cooperate with organizations like Elephant Action League? Absolutely. This is a this is a very important point that you mentioned. Uh, it affects a lot, not only our work, but in general. Uh, I can tell you, for example, I can give you a very easy example in Southeast Asia, where we mentioned before that, you know, some of the most important wildlife traffickers in the world live there. You have a country like Thailand, where not only it's easy to uh, establish, uh, you know, a, a, a connection, a, a working collaboration with uh, Thai authorities, but they also kind of proactive on that. They, for example, they became probably the best. The Thai custom, I think, is the best in Southeast Asia in terms of profiling people coming from Africa, for example. So they are able to understand uh, before they land in Bangkok if this guy, uh, you know, potentially uh, can carry something illegal. Um, and and they do operation. They put people in jail. The opposite, you find it in Vietnam or even worse in Laos, where, you know, they really they are now a safe haven for wildlife traffickers because the government, not only the local government, not only do not do much, but he's actually protecting some of them. So because, of course, it's a lot of money and, and, and some of the top officials are involved as well. So it's a big problem. I can tell you the same in Africa. There are countries like uh, Kenya, for example, where you where you find law enforcement a little bit more active than other countries. And it's easy to, you know, to, to collaborate or at least to exchange information, to give them information. And the opposite is, I don't know, the Republic of Congo, for example, where it's absolutely, you know, as you can imagine, sort of no man land, uh, zero rule of law, and you can do whatever you want. You just pay and you can put on a plane, whatever you want. It's a big problem. Uh, as an organization, of course, we are we try to uh, operate where we can make a difference. So it means, among other things, it means where there is a receptive law enforcement or uh, government agency that is willing and happy to receive information from us. Doesn't mean necessarily that we have to work together, but at least you 
you law enforcement have to acknowledge that we can provide useful information for you and then you can use this information as you please and if you arrest people you can actually even get the, take the credit for it we don't care as long as you do it of course another country where we are working is mexico for example for the totoaba vaquita crisis and we are we are in constant contact with the with the mexican government a bunch of ministries we share information with them so we put a lot of effort in understanding not only the the right government agencies in each country but also the right person because we want to deliver our intelligence reports to that very person that we know is not corrupt is honest and he and he's and really trying is really trying to do something so in some other countries it's impossible so but i can give you i mean i can tell you for example that we are we have been sharing with the chinese government for years now they 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 acknowledge and they thank uh, they don't tell you absolutely they never they will never tell you what they are doing with you with doing the information but at least they are willing to accept it and that's good it's a beginning you know as i always say china is a, is a big part of the problem right now in terms of environmental crime at the same time we need china to to solve it you know without china without having china on board without working learning to work with china we will lose everything there's we can go home everyone today uh, that's why we put a lot of you know we try our best to work with them and to share information that they can use that's really fascinating to learn about the relationship with china because i know that china is the buyer and the seller of so many of these wildlife organs and and parts of these creatures so i think it's a lesson in how to work with quote the enemy so to speak um or work with the you know the person on the opposite side of the spectrum but that we can't deny that we are going to have to work with people that we absolutely disagree with or people that we think are the worst of the worst in any whether it's within logging and pipelines and, you know, whatever we're, we're fighting against. So I, I really, I'd love to hear more about that later, but I do want to talk about this anti-poaching and militarization. And so I'd love to transition into a conversation around yeah. the militarization of conservation with you. But before doing so, I'll, I'll clarify that you advocate intelligence work as a means to prevent the rising militarization of conservation, which I'm sure you're more than familiar with. Uh, the militarization right. of conservation is also described as eco-militarization or the greening of the military. And with the rise of eco-militarization, we have also seen the coalescence of conservation groups and private defense corporations, where I imagine these corporations are making significant money by providing emerging technology. So my first question is, how are big conservation organizations complicit in funding militarized conservation operations? And my second question is, what future problems does this method pose if we continue to normalize violence and military intervention as a rational application of conservation and species protection? Two very good questions, and uh, and they are... They address very, very important issue for me, which is exactly this, the militarization of conservation, which is a consequence of what we were talking about before. So everyone is fixated on anti-poaching. Everyone wants to see anti-poaching and they, they think they the only way to fight back is basically anti-poaching. What anti-poaching means? Uh, it means boots on the ground, uh, special forces, weapons and drones. And I don't know, one time, one day I, would, I'm expect, I expect to see missiles. And because they, they thought, they, they, and they still think that poaching is the beginning of the problem, while in fact is the very end of the problem, is almost a consequence of the problem. The problem is trafficking and demand that comes before poaching. But because of this, I would say decades of policies by, by especially the big NGOs, but also donors focus mostly on anti-poaching. What that basically led to the rise of uh, a whole industry around anti-poaching. Uh, you know, you find uh, former special uh, forces training local uh, forces, 
I, I know them very well. I, I met some of them. I've been, I'm very familiar with the whole thing. I witnessed myself some of those trainings uh, in, in different countries. And you can see that uh, the scope of work is simply to kill the poachers. And it's um, at the same time very sad to see uh, because, you know, I remind you that the, a lot of the poachers are poor people and they are offered three, four, five years of salary to kill one elephant. And maybe they have a family of five, ten at home waiting for them. So it's very, you know, as I always say, in Africa, in those conditions, it's actually very difficult to remain honest. It takes, I don't know, a lot of courage because the temptation is simply too big. As I always say, if I start offering here in Los Angeles five, ten times the salary of a person to do something, I will have long lines of people willing to do pretty much everything here in Los Angeles. Can imagine in the middle of Africa, people that, you know, who doesn't have anything. So you see now you have all these uh, different groups doing different things, working with the former special forces. They are working with drones, training local uh, groups, local rangers in all sort of uh, guerrilla warfare, ambush. And uh, in some cases, you know, you have a few places in Africa, for example, Garamba National Park in Congo, where, yes, you have a very, very unique situation in terms of poaching. Poachers are actually militias and sometimes uh, basically terrorists. So you do need this kind of preparation if you want to protect a national park. But in many other cases, in my opinion, everyone is just putting a, a lot of money into fighting back with weapons, while in reality, what you really need is to fight back with information. Intelligence decreased the militarization of information. Imagine to fight a war. I don't know. Nobody likes war, so I don't want to. I don't want to, you know, make an example that uh, people will not like. But imagine to fight the, a war against terrorists in Afghanistan without intelligence. Simply bombing left and right and killing single, I don't know, Taliban, and and that's it. And then a little bit of propaganda awareness. That's it. Without intelligence, without knowing who does what and who is very, for real important and who is not important at all. Right now, we are fighting environmental crime like this, blind. We are just uh, killing people and, and try to convince uh, consumers not to buy this product. We know now what is the situation, so I, it's mind-blowing. You know, it's, I, I really don't understand why the people and the, in the international community doesn't understand that without intelligence, we will lose not only these species very soon, but we will also lose all the millions of dollars that we put to protect these species so far. Yeah, it's really insane. It's just, it doesn't make sense. And I know, I've seen the propaganda that you're talking about where people are saying, oh, look at it, it's the local people, they're armed. The local people are the ones protecting the wildlife against the poachers. And there is this kind of villain and hero story narrative that people get attached to and you know and it's a very it's a very deep narrative for us as humans the the enemy and the victorious justice seeking person and as much as i i can understand this narrative i also see this other narrative coming up right now too i actually just read an article and it was titled millions of forest dwelling people are about to be evicted in the name of conservation and the, the headline, the Supreme Court of India has directed 16 states to evict all scheduled tribe members and other traditional forest dwellers before July 27th, whose claims were rejected under the Forest Right Act in 2006. And it's it's interesting because, you know, there's there's this issue that poachers are coming into these lands and killing wildlife. But then there's also an issue of indigenous people's and conservationists thinking that they're in the way of the wildlife. So I'm seeing these two um, pieces, and I I know that you know I'm not sure if you are aware of the uh, removal of indigenous peoples from land, say in Africa or Latin America, is tied in with the poachers, or do you feel like this is just a whole other narrative altogether in the name of protecting the wildlife? Yeah, I think it's a different. It's a different narrative, partially linked to 
environmental crime. But you you also have to, uh, for example, in Africa, you also have to think that uh, there is no uh, there's over there. Of course, you that you you have no absolutely no zoning or planning when you urban planning when you build stuff. Okay, so. A lot of important national parks are not only completely surrounded by by villages, by people, but also, of course, these people needs to needs to survive. They need uh, they need the wood for the fire and everything. So they uh, they need to graze uh, the fine place for the cows to graze. So there is a pretty significant, you know, anthropic pressure on those wild places and the wild places are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, my prediction is that, you know, in, in, in maybe in a few decades from now in Africa, you will see wild animals just in within very large enclosures and, and that's it. And, you know, national parks here and there, and that's it. It will be because at the same time, there is also no control on, uh, on the growth of the population. So there's no family planning as well. So you have every year you have, millions of new people who need a job who need to eat who need to do you know to live uh, and less and less space for for the wild creatures you know for wilderness then it's up to us you know to decide collectively okay how much how many wild animals we want we cannot have as many as we want because simply there is no space anymore but my point is that whatever you decide then you really have to protect it and and you don't protect those wild spaces just by hammering on you know on the poor people around the park uh, jailing poachers and deploying uh, the military that i don't think is, is the right way to protect those places you have to have a more strategic approach uh, again based on intelligence based on to know who does what to base what's you know what's going on in that place and w- of course it goes without saying work with local population as much as possible you know the locals are your first line of defense uh, you know are the guardians so you they, you have to find a way to have them on board you just need uh, a couple of very organized criminal groups to create havoc you know to destroy everything uh, under the nose of law enforcement and under the nose of local population so it's it's a very very difficult situation i have to admit there are simply not not enough space for wild animals. And at the same time, many of those wild animals are now a product, a very, very profitable product. So how do you protect? How do you protect them? Again, an example from Mexico, the Tutuaba crisis and the Baquita crisis. Uh, fishermen over there, they're very poor and they usually make around $500, $600 per month fishing shrimps and other fishes. With only one Totoaba fish, they make $5,000. So how do you stop that? There is a, I went there, I spent there a year and a half. There is absolutely nothing else to do in terms of work. The government is far away. Uh, they all have families. And the whole thing is actually now managed by organized crime. So how do you protect a place like that? I think it's self-evident that you will not be able to protected with weapons you have to deploy the whole army to protect a place like that and still probably will not be uh, effective you have to be more strategic and more intelligent to approach those kind of problems unfortunately i don't see this uh, strategy being used uh, almost anywhere in the world actually
I hear your analysis and I was thinking back to The Ivory Game, a film that you were in with Richard Lacani as director. And it was really, yeah. gosh, just I remember this scene of villagers in Africa and they were so frustrated with the elephants because the elephants were coming into their farms and destroying their crop and they needed to feed their children. And so there was a, there was this uh, kind of battle around like, well, is the government or conservation groups going to pay for fences so that the elephants can't get into their home and their farms? And they were saying, we will kill these elephants if they continue to ruin our crops because we need to feed our children. And so I, I really hear this complex issue of, well, the wildlife needs space to survive. And then the local people, many of whom, most of whom are impoverished, they need space to live, create homes, yeah. create jobs, you know, have water. Uh, and water is, you know, we know the water crisis all over the globe and there, the water is dwindling more and more and more. Of course, the water isn't dwindling for corporate resource extraction projects because those the corporations get as much water as they need, but then what's left over is minimal yeah. for the rest of the people and the and the wildlife. So I I do see the complexity of this and I feel such heartache going into the future knowing that all of us humans uh, more than humans we are going to be struggling to see who gets to survive. Um Absolutely. you know who who gets to have the resources in order to continue living and it, and it's really it's really challenging and so of course i go back to this question of ultimately we need to go for the root of the problem and the root of the problem i'm wondering you know is that demand and then let's just say we're only talking right now about the poaching i'm yep. wondering is the root of the problem the demand so how is demand destroyed and who oversees this and then, you know, we talked about how to do this without criminalizing the poor and with cultural sensitivity in mind, given that historically global environmental interventions have been part of a problematic Western imposition, imperialism, and assimilation. So if we need to go to um, destroy the demand, yeah, I kind of just want you to be able to speak to this this big lump of confusion that I've just laid on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because on the you know mainstream media present this problem, in my opinion, is in an over simplistic way, putting a lot of you know a lot on the on the shoulders of of poachers and and um, and talking mostly just about the poaching grounds. It's actually more complex. And when you start analyzing the complexity of this problem, then you get into this mental matrix because then you understand, oh wow, it's it's not only complex, but we are actually. We have been focusing on the right, on, on on a very small portion of this problem for decades, and elephants actually is a good example. You know, elephants just in 200 years is incredible what happened to elephants. You know, 200 years ago they we had around 27 million elephants in Africa 200 years ago. A hundred years ago there were already only five million, and now it's 350 thousand elephants probably in the whole Africa. It's a sort of a holocaust almost in 200 years. They've been wiped out from the continent. And still, we still have this problem. If you ask many countries in Africa, they will tell you there are still too many. Because why there are too many? Well, because people, there's a lot of people now and compared to 200 years ago, and it's simply not space enough. But just, you know, going back to the China problem, I have one example, a very recent from our work that explain how poaching is actually connected to the demand and to China. So we have been working, as you said, on this uh, problem in Baja California, illegal fishing of Totoaba and the extinction basically of the vaquita, this little, little dolphin, little porpoise. So we have been sharing information with the Chinese authorities for over a year on the Chinese traffickers. So illegal traders that would traffic also Totoaba swim bladder, okay? Just to give you an example, uh, for this uh, swim bladder, we just said in the Gulf of California, fishermen get something like $5,000, especially if it's a female, from one swim bladder. The same swim bladder on the black market in China is easily get goes to $30,000, $35,000, $50,000. Saw, we've seen uh, bladders at $100,000. Okay, So imagine the profits behind. That's why, again, it's a, a criminal organization behind 
So what happened be, uh, recently is that the Chinese authorities arrested about a month and a half ago. There was the very first big bust in China on Totoaba traffickers. They arrested dozens of people and uh, millions of dollars of, of Totoaba seized. At the same time, the Mexican authorities are finally putting some pressure on the Chinese traders in Mexico. And we, all, we are also doing the same, you know, openly with our work and with the, with the film Sea of Shadows. So there's a, there's a new pressure on the Chinese side of this problem. So very interesting. interestingly, about a week ago, we have sources on the ground in Mexico, in Baja California, and these sources were telling us, listen, we are seeing something strange. The price of Totoaba collapsed from $5,000 to 2500 and some illegal fishermen and traders and uh, basically criminals are complaining that because of the pressure on the Chinese traders in Mexico and in China, this whole thing became all of a sudden too complicated, too dangerous, and and not profitable as it used to be because the Chinese traders do not have enough money to invest in, in new nets, so in new illegal fishing activities. And that is extremely interesting. This is a, a great example of what intelligence and investigative work can do on the supply chain. So all of a sudden, you are choking the demand uh, along the entire supply chain because it becomes not profitable enough. And why? Because the key players along the supply chain are finally getting some pressure. And that's, a, I think, is a great example of uh, what we should be seeing in many other instances, in many other supply chains. Good uh, intelligence work and investigative work leading to effective law enforcement action uh, that causes, uh, you know, some, some sort of ripple effects along the supply chain all the way to the poaching grounds. That's a great example of uh, we should be all working towards this from now on and without uh, overdoing uh, on the on you know on the poachers. It's interesting to hear how the demand. It's not so much the people who are trying to buy the Totowaba bladder for medicine. It's like the demand comes from this this really greedy desire to make as much money as the cartels can. So it's like an inflated amount. It's not it's not really the demand of the medicine. It's this inflation due to these criminalized organizations or some I think that's how I'm understanding right. it. Correct. The side of the problem is also of course the consumers for the, in this case in China and they have to be educated that it is wrong to buy Totoaba for example or it is wrong to buy rhino horn. Let, but let's not forget they have been doing this for centuries and only in the very young Chinese generation we are beginning to see a change. They are different from their fathers and mothers. But it will take time. It will take at least a full generational change before seeing some significant effects in the consumer mind in China. In the meantime, you have to find a way to tackle this problem in different ways. And the only way we found is, okay, it's crime. Let's let's fight it as a crime, not as an environmental issue only. It's actually crime because these traders along the supply chain have all the interest in fueling the demand and in pouring, in this case, Totoaba or even Rhino, continue to bring, never stop. So a consumer, if he wants to buy Rhino or if, he wants to, if they want to buy Totoaba, they have to be able to do it. But let's not forget those consumers can buy many other things, including legal things. Okay, It's not that they die if they don't buy Totoaba. If the one day they will not find Totoaba anymore or it, or it will become so difficult or so dangerous and police will put you in jail, believe me, they will stop doing it because there is one thing only that the Chinese consumer fear and is law enforcement, nothing else. They are afraid of their government and they are afraid of law enforcement. So every time law enforcement really wants to change something, they can do it overnight, basically, in that country. So right now they don't do it because it's not a priority. But you have to... You, you don't have to think of the consumers, of the very final consumer, as the only engine behind the whole thing. It's very wrong. It's equally wrong as to as seeing the poachers as the engine behind the whole thing. It's, and I know it it's, makes sense to think, as you said before, these are two narratives that are easy to understand, right? The villain, the poacher, the bad guy in the field who killed the animal, and then the Chinese, uh, you know, rich guy that, who buys ivory. Yes, 
they are part of the same equation. But what I'm saying is that they are not the most important variable of this equation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It makes so much sense. I am so just blown away by the work that you and your team do, Andrea. It, it's so important. It's very courageous and it isn't talked about enough. And I'm really grateful to you in this conversation, how you've been able to kind of smash through these simplistic narratives that we're told and to really start to help us understand how these systems maintain themselves and what we could do to actually disrupt the flow of these cartels and and how that ties into the bigger systems of government, economics, relationships with local people, poverty. I mean, it's it's just so dense. And um, I'm really happy that there are people like you who are out there giving their lives. And I, I hear the sacrifice that you and others have had to give in order to protect these creatures, these kin of ours. And I want to say that um, I know in this modern culture, we're kind of taught that we are the most important people, humans or ourselves, you know, we got to make sure we're happy. We got to, you know, why sacrifice? But anything that is really worth it, take sacrifice. Any Anything that we want to see changed in this in this very twisted world, it will take sacrifice from each of us to bring these solutions to fruition. And so I, I'm so grateful that you were willing to do that with your life. And, you know, like I said, I have probably a hundred more questions rattling in my head, but for now I am going to really sit with this information. <laughs> I, it's actually, this is a, I have to tell you, it was a very great, I mean, it was a great interview. You had really good question that I rarely hear, if not ever. And uh, because the, the problem is that a lot of media approach this, uh, this problem in a very simplistic way and it's not good when you oversimplify something that is really complicated. The risk is to, is to put your attention on the wrong part of the problem. Oh my gosh, absolutely. The risk, I mean, the, the attention and the money. I mean, the attention yeah. and the funding to go into the wrong place that's never going to actually resolve the issue. And then, and then what's so yeah. dangerous is that we think we're doing something, whether if we're donating, we think we're doing it, but that's what's dangerous about that. That's, that's the, you said something so important that myself, I repeated so many times during my speeches and conferences when there's nothing more dangerous in, in general, in life for a person, when you think you are doing something and in reality, you're not doing anything. That's super dangerous. Then when the bad guys really laugh at you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I definitely see that being the same thing with um, a lot of social media. You know, we, we keep thinking that we're doing things. But it's really just this ball of distraction. That's a that that could be a whole hour conversation in and of itself. Just the strategies of the strategies and yeah. the mis, myths and misinformation of how we are going about our tactics. It's really interesting. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was from Ila Bamba. I'd like to thank our incredible team who works so hard day in, day out to bring you this content. First, our podcast audio producer, Andrew Stores, our media researcher and writer, Francesca Glassfell, our social media coordinator, Aaron Wise, and Carter Lou McElroy, our music coordinator. <laughs>